kind of a, a fun title as well. I wanted to dig into what, what um, we're meaning by that. And so uh, deep flat models, what do we, what do we mean? Um, well, the deep has to do with uh, deep representation. So you have these deep networks and their, their real claim to fame right now is taking perceptual data or even something slightly above perceptual data and coming up with features, deep features. Um, and, and they've been pretty uh, powerful in that sense. Uh, now the flatness is what um, we're gonna try to do is take a deep latent representation and turn it into a flat or tabular MDP model. Seems like a crazy thing to do, um, what we'll, but, but the, the nice thing about it is if you do that and you can do it successfully, uh, you can apply optimal planning, like really simple optimal planning without worrying about all of these uh, other issues that we want to get to later on, such as, well, how can we get more interesting symbolic structure in the model? And so, uh, so you know, I really like this idea of uh, trying to be able to use an optimal planning or a near optimal planning algorithm because all of the uncertainty in the algorithm that, you know, why is it not working comes down to, you know, the, the quality of this model um, as opposed to the quality of the, uh, the planner. So, so what we're gonna do is uh, now, I'm, I'm gonna walk through the other aspects of the title and give you some perspective on, on how we uh, decided to start working on this, this problem. And that will also give you some perspective on you know, where, where this work is hopefully going. So, so model-based, um, so that's, that's another part of the title. And you know, until, until very recently, uh, model-free uh, deep RL has really reigned supreme. Uh, it, it would be more likely to see a statement such as uh, model-based approaches are very promising and we like the idea of them, but so far they have not shown any uh, ability to outperform model-free. And you might still see that a little bit, but I think it's changing very rapidly. And in fact, uh, there's model-based algorithms that, that are you know, pretty convincingly showing uh, superiority. And you just saw one of them. Uh, you can call mu zero a model-based algorithm. Uh, but but even uh, I would say you know this is a related approach uh, you know Dreamer is just one example of another recent model based algorithm uh, that is just beating the pants off some model free methods. And these model free methods are, are learning with you know a hundred thousand times more uh, data, and and uh, the model based methods are winning. Uh, now now why why is this? What you know I was asking. You know, one of my students, why, you know, why is it that we're seeing these model-based methods just out of the blue all of a sudden uh, start to outperform the model-free methods? And, and one, one hypothesis here, and I'm curious in what other people think, is this difference between learning observational models, learning and using observational models versus latent models. So an observational model is what you would do without thinking a whole lot, uh, you know, because it's a natural thing take the observation, here's a observation in Atari, take the action and predict the next observation, right? If you can do this perfectly, you can use the model to drive a model-free algorithm or maybe even some sort of search-based algorithm. It turns out to be really hard to do that well and to, to make the models accurate enough so they, they have a, a long enough time horizon to, to make planning pay off, um, you know, and, and so, you can imagine uh, also, you know, why, why do we want our models to even try to produce you know, photorealistic uh, images, for example, um, or, or produce every aspect of, of the blocks world, like at, at a photorealistic level or even a cartoon level. Um, so, so it seems like the wrong thing to be doing, especially you know, in the planning community, we work with abstractions all the time that are very far away from real data. So, what, what you see now uh, in model-based methods, the, the ones that really seem to be starting to work are they're moving to the latent space representations. And I don't need to say much about this because you just saw a talk on mu zero, which is a great example of this. But what, what these methods do is you use an encoder. Usually this is gonna be a neural network. The encoder takes the observation. Usually it, it will often be an observation sequence. This might be a recurrent network. Uh, produces a latent state vector 
um, it will be some high dimensional vector. And now all the reasoning, all the internal reasoning is gonna be done in terms of this object. And, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, our, our, our preferences at ICAPS, we might like this object to have lots of rich structure. Um, right now they're, they're just high dimensional vectors. So we, we can hopefully get to ones that have rich structure. But, but then you're gonna learn your model, your transition model in this latent space and the reward function uh, in the latent space. And as long as you can learn this latent space model so that it predicts the reward given you know, this, this initial mapping to your latent space and then any sequence of actions, as long as you can do that, you can drive search algorithms, for example, uh, Monte Carlo tree search. And that's what you saw Mu Zero do. And, and as far as I can tell, moving to this latent space model, this is where, where you're starting to see the real performance gains in model-based reinforcement learning in recent years. So, so I'm curious you know, to hear later on if other people believe that's one of the main game changers. So, so one of the things that's disappointing from, from a, an ICAPS point of view, a planning point of view is, uh, so they are model-based methods are really starting to work in reinforcement learning, but most of them are not doing anything that we would consider to be real planning. Um, uh, most of them, in fact, are using the model to generate extra data for a model-free algorithm. So this might be a policy gradient algorithm, and, and you're just using it to generate lots and lots more data. Um, so you don't have to collect new data um, from the real environment. You're creating this imagined data. Like imagination is sort of the uh, uh, key word they, they use for this sort of thing. But that's nothing more than generating data from your model. And so that, that's great in some ways because, uh, you know, one, one reason is for continuous uh, actions, uh, it, it's hard to come by good planners these days and, and model free algorithms are good at dealing with continuous actions, um, but, but it's fairly limited, right? You're, this way of using a model is gonna be limited in the same ways that model free algorithms are just inherently limited. You know, sparse reward is still gonna be a problem for them uh, and, and all of the other issues that you might come across. But that, that's what's being done for the most part. Now, you just saw an example um, that is uh, uh, an alternative, and this is, well, you, I guess you saw two examples that are alternatives, uh, mu zero, and then the, the work on uh, iterative widening that you just saw. Uh, those are learning these black box simulators. Uh, I guess iterative widening wasn't learning it, but uh, mu zero was learning a black box simulator in terms of a neural network that can be used to guide tree search. Um, so this is, this is a good step. It's a better policy improvement operator. But uh, you know, honestly, Monte Carlo tree search is almost as blind as model free RL, unless you have all of the extra learning around it for value functions and, and the policy guidance. And so, so if you haven't uh, been able to learn all those things, uh, model free uh, Monte Carlo tree search is also pretty pretty blind in some sense from, from a planning perspective at ICAPS. What, what we you know, would really love to have and envision is when is being able to use our symbolic planners that have a nice structured representation of the state. Like this is you know, the, an example of a nice structured operator uh, and have our algorithms analyze that structure to produce heuristics or pruning rules or landmarks. Uh, reason about that structure to uh, to do much better than than a Monte Carlo planning algorithm might be able to do or, or model free RL. Um, sadly, um, although maybe happily, there's been very little work done in this area. Uh, so the integrating deep RL with uh, with symbolic uh, types of planning algorithms, I would say uh, the there's really very, very little work. And this is one piece of recent work that I point you to do. Uh, but you know, even this, even this uh, is very early on and there's a lot of room to improve. So this is a great opportunity for us, I think. And I'll come back to this at the end. So, so, now, uh, so, so now let's uh, look into, uh, I just wanted to give you one more perspective from, from a planning research point of view. So, so what should be the planning and learning primitives for model-based RL? 
Well, learning primitives were pretty much, we have some pretty good primitives, uh, these CNNs, autoencoders, um, things like that. They've been developed in the deep learning community already and they leverage GPU resources. But we don't really have a concept of what you know, the standard uh, planning primitives might be and, and, and how we might uh, you know, interact, with, interact with the learning and planning primitives. And so you know, Monte Carlo tree search, you might think of that as a primitive now and, and the type of model you need to learn for that is somewhat clear. Um, but uh, you know, symbolic planners are not really a primitive yet. I'm gonna talk about one primitive today, uh, which is maybe the most trivially symbolic primitive and planner, which is gonna be a GPU-based tabular uh, version of value iteration. And, and the interesting thing here is that it's really nice if your primitives can leverage the same types of resources that, that the learning primitives do. And this one does, this is gonna be able to leverage GPU resources. Um, so, so without uh, further ado, let's move to the other keyword in the title. Um, offline. So, so offline basically is opposed to online RL. So typically online RL, um, what we are going to say characterizes that is you're getting data from your, you know, some exploration policy, which is usually related to, to a good policy that you've discovered. And then you're, you're updating the policy somehow, and then you're collecting more data. So you're in this loop. Um, the nice thing about this loop, especially in a model-based uh, case, is that uh, you've learned your model and maybe it has some errors, but, but those errors can be weeded out by just going through this loop and, and fixing it based on more data. Offline is a different animal. You're just gonna be given a whole bunch of data which is collected, you know, who knows, hospitals, um, you know, online advertising, uh, you get this buffer of data, you don't get to collect any more data. Um, instead, you just have to output a policy. And this is what I'm gonna be focusing on today. And this is, this is actually a very, I think this is a really great problem for people in the planning community to start looking at, because you, you might argue that this is a place where, where planning algorithms have, might have an edge if we can do things correctly, uh, because you can't rely on being able to get 10 million more uh, data samples that effectively let a model free algorithm work. So you have to use your data as efficiently as possible. And perhaps models are a way to do that. So, so I, I think this is an area we might even wanna have competitions on this particular topic. Um, I would say there is an, uh, a crisis, uh, this may be a bit dramatic, but there, there is an offline RL evaluation crisis um, Usually offline RL is described this way, but, uh, but the way that they actually evaluate things, if you look closely at the papers, are they'll run the, so, so they'll run an iterative algorithm. And you can see the iterations go up and down, like the performance is down as you continue to run the algorithm. You're not collecting more data, you're just iterating you know, a model-free algorithm or something. Uh, and, and they'll just perform, report the best performance. And so, I don't know when that became legal, but, but it became legal somehow. And, and now people are actually uh, starting to talk about it, uh, that maybe it should not be legal. And I just wanted to clarify um, uh, how we're, we're gonna think about the offline problem to make this, this uh, what we consider to be maybe illegal explicit. So we're gonna say uh, you have some offline data and what you get to do is you get to output uh, some number of policies, NE. Uh, based on the offline uh, data. And then you're gonna get to do online evaluation of each of those policies and return the best. This is kind of a plausible scenario. And when uh, the number here is one, that just corresponds to pure offline learning. So, so now uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, our work in this area. Uh, and and uh, th this is recent work, uh, it's on archive now. Uh, and we're going to basically follow this approach that I, I talked about of forming a flat MDP, solving it with value iteration, and then, uh, then getting a policy. And this is gonna be in the, the offline RL framework. So we have a fixed set of data. And, and it sounds crazy at first, but you know our MDP is gonna be about the same size as the data set. And, that 
you know, so if you can scale to millions of data points, uh, a million, you know, a state space of the size of millions of, of states, then, then uh, you can scale to a lot of the RL problems that we care about. And in fact, the RL problems that we care about, typically people are trying to make the data set smaller and be able to do better with, with smaller data sets. So, so uh, as long as we can scale to the big ones, I, I think we're, we're in good shape. So, so it might not be as crazy as it sounds at first to think about going back to flat MVPs. So there has been work on this uh, a couple of years ago um, that, that uh, the, the approach they took, I'm not gonna say much about this, you can look at the reference, was to learn an autoencoder similar to what we saw in, the, in one of the previous talks. And in the middle of this autoencoder, they have a, a, a discrete representation. So they, they use a particular way of discretizing uh, the, uh, the representation. And so inside this neural network, it produces a discrete state space. And using that, you can compile it out and, and run value iteration effectively. Uh, without saying much more, um, I would say it showed some promising results in some 3D navigation, but it hasn't shown the ability to scale yet um, uh, to anything like Atari scale problems. They showed results in Pong, but then explicitly said it wasn't able to work on some other on the other Atari games. So, so it's still, yeah, what was questionable whether this sort of thing could get to work. So I'm gonna give you a high level view of what we do. So we start with a data set and we start with some, uh, latent state encoding. So, so this could be any, you can use any, uh, any uh, encoding method that you want, learning method that you want for this. Uh, it can be continuous or discrete. We, we're working with continuous ones. Uh, and then, then we you can think of just building a data graph of, that has the transitions in it that, that you, you originally have. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of states in this graph are gonna be missing actions, right? You, you might have only seen one action out of this state. And in fact, in our data, typically we only see one, each state one time. And so, uh, so to get a useful model, you have to be able to say, well, what happens here if I take action A, um, even though I haven't seen it? And so you have to interpolate it somehow. And we're gonna use a, a nearest neighbor style approaches for this, uh, which, which is, it's motivated by a framework I'll show you in a minute. And, and, and based on that type of interpolation, we're gonna be able to interpolate what each action does um, when we haven't seen it. Then we're gonna solve this flat MDP via value iteration. Um, and, and then we're going to lift this MDP to the full continuous latent state space. Um, and effectively, uh, we're gonna have this non-parametric uh, representation of the solution to this continuous MDP. So, so to make that clear, um, what I wanna do first is just say this, this is motivated by, uh, by uh, some work in 1995 by Gordon, his averagers framework with a little known result. It's almost, it's not quite a footnote, but it's almost a footnote in this paper. So, so that work, you started with an MDP, a data set representing an MDP and a function approximator, which was, which was called an averager in that, that paper. And what, what he showed was that uh, doing approximate dynamic programming, uh, which you roughly have, a lot of you probably have an idea of what that means, but you're, using, you're doing dynamic programming with a function approximator in it. Uh, that, that's convergent if you use an averager, uh, it converges to something. This isn't necessarily gonna be optimal, but it's gonna converge, uh, which was better than what they could say otherwise. Now there's a theorem in that paper um, that says this process is equivalent to forming a particular type of MDP that, that depends on the, the MDP and the averager, so M prime, and solving that MDP. You get the same solution, you converge to the same solution. Uh, they didn't really do anything with this observation. They just, just made it. Um, and, and we're gonna try to do something with this observation. Um, and in particular, uh, combine it with, with deep representation learning. So, so what does this look like? So uh, the deep averagers MDP is gonna be this continuous MDP. And, and how do we define it? Well, first we need the notion of nearest neighbor. So for state action pair, we have a data set and we have, a, we have some distance function 
on state action pairs. And what we're going to do is define the reward function for any state action pair in this continuous space, uh, or, or so many discrete actions, um, as uh, the average of the rewards of the nearest neighbors of that state action pair. And similarly, for a transition function, we're going to define the transition function as a, uh, we're gonna get the nearest neighbors for S and A, and then it's gonna be just a uniform distribution over the next states of those, uh, those neighbors. Um, so so this is a very simple way of defining uh, an empirical MDP. And then the question is, how do we solve it? Like this is still like a continuous MDP. I don't really know how to solve that, especially with tabular value iteration. And so, uh, so the first thing you can do is you can say, well, the Q function, you know, based on these definitions, is going to have this nice form. Uh, and in particular, it's really only going to depend on the nearest neighbors of S and A, which are in our data set. And so if we can compute the Q functions for the states in the data set, we're all done. And, and it turns out that uh, since the uh, transitions of the states in our data set only go to each other and the core, the, 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 not, the states outside of our data set only go to states in our data set, according to this definition, all we need to do is solve this core state MDP. That's what we call it um, over the, the data in our data set. So this is gonna be a finite state, finite MDP. We can solve it and then we can basically just to, you essentially think of it as a non-parametric uh, uh, representation of the full policy of this continuous MVP. So, uh, so that, that's basically how this, uh, this works. Now, the, there's a problem with just applying this right out of the box. Um, when the model is wrong, uh, this is a well-known thing, right? When, when, you're, when your model is wrong, the planner will try to exploit it uh, to its fullest. And so, this is just showing you an example in Lunar Lander. Uh, apologize for going fast, but there, the data actually is showing you a successful landing and an unsuccessful landing. Now, when we form the DAC MD, this, uh, this uh, averagers MDP, it's gonna add in all these other transitions. And what the planner will do is really good at finding these loops, these positive loops. And if you solve this in Lunar Lander, like this is, you know, from this state, go up, then go down, then go up, then go down. And it gets a little bit of reward when it gets closer to the ground. And so it, it's a really good little state in its imagination. Uh, and, but, but it's not actually true. It doesn't work. If you do it, you, you end up like this. And so you somehow need to guard against these, uh, these inaccurate pieces of the model that the planner can exploit in bad ways. And, and we, we uh, solve this in a way that's been looked at in the past, especially in robotics. Damian Ernst had some really good work in this area. Um, but we're just gonna add a cost uh, to the rewards if, if we don't think that reward is very well represented in the data. So if S and A are not represented well in the data, in other words, they're far away from their neighbors. There's going to be a cost associated with that reward. If S and A are close to all the neighbors, then, then you're pretty much just, just going to have an average reward. So there's going to be a penalty for the planner to use transitions that we're not quite sure about. And when you do this, well, uh, this is what we had before. But now the planner sees, oh, OK, there's a cost associated with this weird transition of Oh, I think I can go up, but but I can't. So that that's one of the key ideas. Um, you you've got to somehow have some notion of uncertainty of your model, and you have to guard against it somehow. Guard against the planner exploiting it. I mean, that's one of the things when we move to symbolic models, we have to figure out how to do that well because that that will just kill us. Um, it, it, the planners love to exploit these little loopholes. Um, all right, so just a review. Basically, we start with the data, we compile it to this DAC MDP. Um, it's a finite MDP, we apply value iteration, and, and that gives us a non-parametric solution over the continuous space. Uh, we need to talk about the VI engine, uh, what this representation is gonna be, and then we have some hyperparameters as well. 
So I won't say too much about this, but uh, we've implemented a GPU version of value iteration. And basically, uh, it scales much, much better than, than a CPU version, as you might guess. But uh, this, is, this is really great. And this is the reason we can actually uh, scale up to, to these, uh, these problems. So, so you see some pretty interesting speed ups. And we're happy to share this implementation for anybody who's interested. There, there just didn't seem to be a good implementation out there widely available. Uh, we were kind of surprised by that. So, uh, and, and this was a very simple implementation too. I think probably a good GPU hack would, could, could do a lot better. Um, so that's a big part of, uh, of what, we're, what we're doing here and why we can do this. So I'm gonna show you three experimental results. Um, one is gonna be just to look at the properties of the DAC MVP. Um, using an Oracle encoding function. So, so we're going to look at uh, cart poll, kind of a boring domain, but, but the Oracle encoding function is just the standard state representation of cart poll, the angle, uh, you know, angular velocities and position, and the position and velocity uh, of the cart. And we just want to look at some basic properties. So, so here, so this is showing you three different offline data sets. This is a data set collected from a random policy. This is a data set collected. This is a data set collected from an optimal policy. This is a data set collected from 50% you know, random, 50% optimal. And we're varying the cost parameter. So when the cost parameter is zero, this corresponds to the original averagers framework. And you can see we don't do very well because the, uh, the planner exploits these crazy things in cart uh, that that should not be exploited. They, they don't correspond to the real world. But very quickly, once you add a little cost, things are more or less uh, fixed by that. One interesting thing is uh, this, when the cost gets really high, basically all the system is doing is trying to follow as closely as possible the data that it has. And when it tries to do that in a random data set, it does really badly. These are the high cost ones. And so, so you can see that there is this, this sweet spot, um, especially when the data is of mixed quality. Um, the K, how much averaging do you need to do? I, I don't want to talk too much about this, but, but K equals to one is not always best. So especially when you have a mixture of data quality. Um, so, so moving to higher Ks is better, but uh, yeah, not, not huge variations when you're, when you're looking at, um, at uh, good data sets. So, so for the more interesting case of Atari, um, now, now we have to talk about where do we get our representation? Like we start out with images. We certainly don't want to do nearest neighbor over images. So we need a latent state space. And what we're going to do is we're going to run. So, so this is a whole research problem that we sort of are going to work on. How do you learn a latent space for our problem uh, particularly? But we're just going to run online, offline model free algorithms on a data set such as DQN or BCQ. And, and as those run each, at every moment, they have some latent representation um, that they're using to compute a Q function. And we're gonna use that. And then for some number of parameter settings of the DAC MDP, we're gonna compute the DAC MDP and their policies. And, and that's gonna be sort of the reason, the best of those is what we return as the DAC DQN or DAC BCQ solution, okay? So what does this look like? So this is on a hundred K, um, so this is a data set of size 100 K, which is relatively small for Atari. Um, when, when you're talking about model free algorithms, model free algorithms are usually in the millions, um, multiple millions. And what we see here is this is the performance of DQN. This, this, uh, this I guess, orange line is the performance of DQN this is a fixed data set as you iterate um, and you can see the performance goes up and down, up and down. And note that each of these spots here is the performance of an online evaluation. So, so in order to know where to stop DQN, you would have to do, an off, do this online evaluation to know whether you stop here or stop here or stop here. Um, you should probably stop here rather than here, but how would you know that besides collecting more data? So what we're doing is now at this point here, um, we're stopping using the representation that DQN has, solving the DAC MDP 
And, and this is what we do. So you can see the DAC MDP is able to find solutions that um, can use the representation of DQN more effectively than, than it can itself at that point. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, same thing for BCQ, which is, is a better algorithm than DQN for offline data. Um, so so it, it was pretty surprising. And, and for me, this was, I was just amazed that this could be made to work for something like Atari. Um, like we're doing optimal planning um, and, uh, on something that represents an Atari game. And so that, that was pretty interesting. Um, so let's look at some other results. Uh, this is when we vary the, uh, the value of NE, how many policies our algorithm outputs. So, so we're going to look at results for NE1. We see that uh, for, for BCQ, we don't always beat it. Uh, sometimes we're worse than, than BCQ uh, when we're using uh, NE equals to one. This is just outputting one policy based on our best guess at the parameters. Uh, for, for the DAC MDP. Um, DQN, we're able to do better usually. But if we uh, are able to pick six different parameter settings and pick among the best, and this is, this is sort of uniform and automated for, for all the Atari games, uh, we, we start to perform quite well um, uh, compared to BCQ. And then with 20, we, we can do even better. So, so that, that's, that's a, another result that we have. Uh, we can scale this up to the million, so 2.5 million uh, data points. And uh, this, is, this is what you get if you use a random uh, representation. So a random network to form your latent representation. Uh, you get non-trivial results. This is normalized according to online DQN performance on like 10 million uh, uh, data points. Um, so not, not doing too bad even with random. But, uh, but now we're looking at, this is what DQN does, and this is what, uh, what we do, uh, the, the dash line. And in most cases, except for breakout, we're able to outperform uh, uh, DQN. And same thing for BCQ. Um, in some cases, there's really big gains to using the representation that they find and then planning on top of that. So I'm just going to show you one other example of something you can do with a planning type approach, which is pretty cool. So this is results in a first person, um, uh, very simple 3D navigation environment. This is, yep, this is showing you the overall, or the first person view. This is showing you the overhead. The, the agent doesn't get that. Um, and this is the optimal policy, right? Now, what if we said, well, you're, you're not, your, your left action is broken. So all we have to do, instead of relearning from RL from scratch, all we have to do is add a big penalty to the left action and resolve the MDP. And you can see that it's able to then say, okay, I'm just gonna turn left now instead of turning right when I used to turn right. And the same thing for the right action. So this is the type of thing that you can start doing in, in reinforcement learning. They might call this zero shot learning one shot learning or something, but uh, we just call it planning in, in a planning literature. Um, so, so I think I'm not going to show you these. I just want to sort of get to the end here. So, so I'd say uh, just to wrap up, you know, we I've shown you something about using uh, tabular planning and model based RL. We've seen that people have successfully used Monte Carlo planning in using uh, black box simulators. Uh, this is a real spot that we, we should be able to make some progress in, I hope. Um, you know, and, and, and this is a paper that I pointed you to that is, is heading in that direction, but there's a ton more work for us all to do. Um, you know, why not try to compile to satisfy ability problems? You know, why not try to compile to PDDL or RDDL and use FFPlan and Llama and Prost? Right. These are things that we should be thinking hard about. Um, and, and overall, um, you know, we, we need to think about where can we demonstrate the value of integrating ICAP style planning and deep representation learning. And so uh, I hope we see some, a lot of theses coming out on this soon. Uh, certainly there seems to be some momentum. Uh, and with that, I don't know if there's time for questions, but, but I'm done.
Okay, thank you very much, Alan. So, uh, so I believe we have some time for questions. There's been a lot of questions in the chat, actually, but uh, I think we try to follow the.